Lovely to be sharing the Word of God today. Uh, as introduced, my name is Kuda, one of the elders in the church, and um, my family has gone home, but yeah, they were there in the first service. <laughs> so today is the fifth installment in our series, uh, Best Seller, and the aim of this series is to make us fall deeper in love with the Word of God, so we trust that if we understand a bit more on it, it helps us to love it, you know? You love that which you know. So that is the aim of the series. It is in three parts. We have the Sunday message, and then we have the devotionals, and we have the midweek meeting where we share. So I would like to invite you to please, if you're not already, to use all three legs of this course. So today's message is about understanding the Old Testament prophecies. Um, <clears throat> so you know the structure of the Bible. There is the first five books, the Torah or the law, and then there are the history books, which is Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and then the first and second Samuel, uh, the Chronicles and the Kings. And then after those, there are the last books in the Old Testament, commonly referred to as the prophets. So there are 17 of them, and if you consider Lamentations to be part of the book of Jeremiah, there are 16, and those are the books that are labeled as the prophetic books. These have records, the written records of the prophets at the time, and I need to state that this is not a record of all prophecy that is there in the Old Testament, but rather it is a collection of the prophecies that were made during the era of the kings. So there are other prophets that have uttered prophetic utterances during those days. Um, one in case in point is Nathan, who confronted David after he had sinned with Bathsheba. And then there are also other prophets that are there. So the books of the prophets, the written books of the prophecies in the Bible, they are... 16 or 17, as, as I said. So they are referred to as major prophets and minor prophets. So the major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then the other 12, um, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are referred to as the minor prophets. Just want to emphasize that the the wording to say major prophets and minor prophets is in no way related to the gravity of the message they contain, but it is just because of the length of the books. So you'll see that Isaiah has 66 chapters, whereas Micah, for instance, has three or four. So it is just the length of the book that uh, gives that role of major or minor. So don't skip through the minor prophets and say these are the smaller guys, okay. And then um, <clears throat> we'd like to look at the role that all the Old Testament prophecy plays. And um, it's, we, we, for, for us to explore this, uh, I'd like to start by asking you to turn to Genesis 3 verse 15. And this, um, in my own understanding, is the first prophecy that I read in the Bible. And... Genesis 3, verse 15, uh, the ESV puts it like this. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So this was God after the fall of man and he is giving out judgment. And so Adam and Eve had disobeyed God by eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. So in essence, they had decided that they would be the ones who determine what is good and what is evil instead of God being the one who decides what is good and what is evil. So effectively, they refused the rulership of the Lord and it was rebellion. And this is when God says this. So you'll see that prophecy predates the prophetic books. It has been there from before the times of the kings when the prophetic books were, were written. 
And Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, gives us a glimpse of this because the Lord speaks um, to the Israelites and says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, which actually shows that in the days of the law, the prophetic was already there. The prophets were already working. So it is the Lord himself who establishes the prophets and we are commanded to pay attention to the words of the prophet. So it is fundamental for us as we try to learn what we can, how we can apply Old Testament prophets to understand that it is God who established the prophets. So we're going to focus on the prophetic writings in the books of the kings uh, for the purpose of this message, but I just wanted to put the background so that we understand how much broader prophecy is. So during the days of the kings, um, the way that the era of the kings started is that after the children of Israel had come into the promised land, uh, you will see it in the book of Samuel, they grumbled to God to say, give us a king so that we can be like all the other nations. At that point in time, their king was God. And you'll see through the book of Judges that no one was the king, they were judges. So they were judges under a king. So the Lord himself was the king. And the people of Israel effectively refused to have God as king, but rather to have a man from among them as king over them. So they refused the kingship of God. They refused to live under the rulership of God. They wanted the rulership of man. They wanted one among them to rule. So you know how the story goes, then God gives them kings. So when they had their kings, they began to live in a godless way. And the state was on a downward spiral. And the voice of the Lord still needed to be heard. And that is why the Lord sent the prophets. Here's one uh, such prophecy. This is in Jeremiah chapter 2 from verse 1 to 5. It says, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate it, eight of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and become, became worthless? So God's desire has been that we be holy. And he speaks time and again to the children of Israel and says, I am holy and I desire for you to be holy. But the nation was now characterized by immorality where there was cursing, lying, murder, stealing, adultery. There was injustice, it was oppression, it was greed. There was idolatry, the worship of false gods. And the prophets announced the judgment of God on the people because they are covenant partners with God and they are walking away from that covenant. And the Lord through Moses, he warns the people of Israel that rebellion would lead to deprivation, to devastation, to disease, deportation, and ultimately death. So the prophets sound a warning to the people of Israel against godless living. And there's a lot we can learn even in our own lives as we read the consequences of living godlessly. So the prophetic books were there to help the people of the Lord to come back to the terms of the covenant with God and to turn from their wicked ways. So you'll see the pattern in the prophetic books is that they say that in the days of king so-and-so, you can see that it is interwoven with the history of Israel. The books of the prophets are calling on Israel to remember the covenant at Sinai. And in general, the, the prophets call out that which the Lord has issued with, and he details the judgment that will follow when disobedience is there. And, um, and more importantly, the Lord gives a way out of the judgment 
when the people turn back and obey. So he shows his character um, that is long established and how ready he is to restore his people to a righteous relationship with him. If you look back at that prophecy that I alluded to, Genesis 3.15, it was while God was speaking out judgment, he was already speaking restoration because he was pointing to Jesus who was going to bruise who was going to crush the head of the serpent while the serpent bruised his heel. It spoke of Jesus' death on the cross and how that was the bruising of the heel, but in that there was the victory. So God is already restoring while he's still pronouncing judgment. So there's a recurring pattern in the Bible where God's people are warned about um, the ways or their ways, and they still continue on that way, and then the judgment of God comes, and then when they cry out and repent, the Lord restores them, and then it happens again and again and again and again. So it shows us that men cannot by themselves be holy. It was impossible for them to get to that place of being holy, and that is only done when Jesus comes the fulfillment of the prophecy that we first alluded to. The other thing that the Old, prophet, the Old Testament prophecy shows us is that there is a difference between God's view and man's view. It shows us that God's view is perfect and in many cases is different from man's view. So the prophets confronted what was deemed right in society or what was deemed right by the king of that day, and he would shine the light on what God's plan was regarding the same thing. The prophets did not offer a negotiation platform where there could be some middle ground that is found between God's view and man's view, but it was straightforward to say that God's view is absolutely right and man has to move towards God's view. And there is no middle ground. It is with God or against God. So it says that God and men are not equal in this um, engagement, in this interaction. The prophetic books do not equalize God and man, but they show that God is absolutely right and he remains absolutely right and that the reconciliation is for men to turn back to God. And we see the faithfulness of God in this. From days of old, we see it in the powerful acts that he did in faithfulness to his promise. Therefore, the failure to be faithful to God would lead in, into God giving man what he has always wanted to rule in his own way and then thus remove the covering of God from him. He says it in Isaiah 55, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways. My ways declares the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your thoughts, higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Throughout the Old Testament prophecy, the faithfulness of God is highlighted. It shows us how God is faithful to the covenant he makes, and this is shown generation after generation as there is king after king in Israel. It is brought to the fore and further demonstrated when the prophecies actually come to pass. And when we consider the prophecies of the exile, when we consider the promises of the restoration, and then we see that all these things have taken place. We therefore are shown the faithfulness of God. With it, we are also shown the failure of man. The inherent tendency to fail is exhibited in a repeated cyclic fashion. Man continues to fail and God continues to restore. They are told, they are reminded again and again, and still they failed. So the prophetic books show us that man is unable on his own to follow God and to keep the covenant of the faithful God. Remember, God desires us to be holy as he is holy. It is a much higher standard than being good. The other hallmark of the Old Testament prophecies is that they warn us of the judgment of God. The prophetic books have stuck warnings to all who read them, and the warning is that there is the judgment of God. The judgment of God is the consequence that follows the covenant breakers and those that are disobedient to the Lord. 
his rules and his statutes. And throughout the, prophet, the prophetic books, it speaks of judgment, it speaks of restoration as well. But obedience for God was one way that the people would get out of the judgment. The prophetic books also show us the coming king. That, I believe, is the whole point of the prophetic books, to show them that in that period they're living under a king, which is something that they chose, but then they point to the fact that there is coming the messianic king, the righteous, just king, the one who will rule the entire nation with equity, with peace, with justice, and all the ideals that God stands for. Everything that man has tried to do for himself and failed, there is a coming king that is coming. Old Testament prophecy points to that day in the future when God's righteous king would come and gloriously rule the whole of creation. So that's basically what the Old Testament prophets speak about. And I think we need to then bring it into our context today. So what would it mean? So one would be quite tempted to limit this to the prophetic books are just there to give us warning of the fallen nature of man and continually remind us of the faithfulness of God. So this is true. That is truth that's established in them. But there is so much more that they show us. And when we consider Old Testament prophecy, we have to look for that more. And the first thing I would like to point to is that all of Old Testament prophecy is fulfilled. Matthew 5 verse 17, we read it last week. These are the words of Jesus. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the laws and all of prophecy. In Jesus, it is all fulfilled, and I find this exciting because once again, this shows us the faithfulness of God in the face of man's incessant failure, and all of it comes together in Christ. It is most thrilling when we read Old Testament prophetic scriptures like this one. In Isaiah 53, verse 4 to 5, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Now, when you read a prophecy like that, and then consider that this prophecy is fulfilled, it gives us courage when we pray for the sick, because we've got a prophecy that is fulfilled that says, and with his wounds we are healed. It gives us confidence when we seek forgiveness for our own failings because it says he was crushed for our iniquities and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Chastisement was literally being flogged for your, sin, for your sins. And this is telling us that Jesus was flogged on our behalf. And we can approach God with confidence in the knowledge that this prophecy is fulfilled. And there's a prophecy like the one recorded in Joel 2.28. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I'll pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. So we can confidently seek for the Lord to pour out his spirit, because we know that this prophecy is fulfilled. We know that the spirit of God is poured out on men and women, upon people of all ages, because we see that this prophecy is fulfilled. This is the prophecy upon which the salvation that we proclaim on calling upon the name of Jesus is based. Because we 
preach today, this is repeated in Romans 10, that when you call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. The prophecy says it. Jesus fulfilled it. Therefore, it is truth now. It is not a wishy-washy dream. It is not a, a desire anymore. It is a reality. We can now proclaim these promises as ours because Jesus has died on the cross. Jesus has fulfilled these prophecies. Even when we read prophecies, we may not like to read. Like this one in Jeremiah 29. From verse 17, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am sending on them sword, famine, and pestilence, and I will make them vile figs that are so rotten they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with sword, famine, and pestilence, and I will make them a horror to all kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, a terror, a hissing, and a reproach among the nations where I have driven them because they did not pay attention to my words, declares the Lord, that I persistently sent to you by my servants, the prophets, but you would not listen, declares the Lord. So while this might bring fear, while this might bring consternation to us, but we can delight in the fact that Jesus has fulfilled this prophecy as well. Remember those things like death, like deportation, disease, he has taken it all. The sword, the famine, and the pestilence that are spoken about have all fallen on Jesus on our behalf when we take these prophecies as fulfilled. All the wrath that man has incurred because of disobedience to God, all the ignorance, all the arrogance was all taken on the one who walked the earth and lived a sinless life. So when we take the fulfillment of this prophecy and when we call upon the name of Jesus and we are saved, we are bringing our judgment, the same judgment that the prophetic books speak about, and it all comes on the cross. And then we are now declared righteous. It says that the Lord will clean us and will be whiter than snow, even if our sins are red as crimson, but he makes us whiter than snow. He makes us a place that is acceptable for a habitation for him. And then he comes by his Holy Spirit to live in us and to make us holy as he is holy. The fulfillment of all prophecy therefore gives us reason to be joyful and highly hopeful because the judgment does not fall on us anymore. So reading the Old Testament scriptures should inspire hope as it is a display of God's impeccable character, which makes us trust him even more. The coming of the Holy Spirit into our lives also changes how we communicate with God. In Hebrews 1, verse 1 to 4, it says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, who appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory and the exact imprint of his nature, the glory of God. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Isn't it exciting in these last days that we can hope to hear from God himself? We do not need someone from outside to speak into our hearts, but we have God to speak to us from the inside and therefore changes us. These words bring life because they are spoken from within us. And because of what Jesus has done, we can look forward to a life lived in intimate relationship with God himself and not through an intermediary. This then leads us to talk about obedience because one of the main things that's spoken about in the Old Testament prophecy is obedience. But this now changes the reason for our obedience. In the days of old, they obeyed so that they could avoid the curses. They obeyed so that they could avoid having the wrath of God over them. They obeyed so that they would not be flogged. But now Jesus has fulfilled the entirety of the laws and the prophets. So what this does is that now we obey God because we love him. He has freed us from obeying under duress. Instead, we now serve the Lord with gladness, primarily because we love him. 
We obey him out of love and not out of compulsion. Obedience that is out of compulsion is no life in it. Because it says the, let, the law, the letter brings death. But obedience that is through love for God has life with it. It gives life to us. It revives us. It refreshes us when we obey because we love God. The prophetic writings, just like the laws, they address every single aspect of human living. So when we consider the prophetic as well, and the fact that it is fulfilled, it means that it removes the boundary between the secular and the sacred. The kingship of God now transcends every sphere of our lives and removes any barriers we may have placed. So there's, there's no longer anything that's under my control. Uh, these are mine and these are God's. So every aspect of our lives be it our finances, our day-to-day -day work, our marriages, our parenting, prayer life, worship, all of these have been brought under the rulership of Jesus. The next application of Old Testament prophecy is that it shows us hope fulfilled and points us to the hope that is coming. The coming of Christ and therefore the fulfillment of the bulk of Old Testament prophecies about him gives us very great hope. We are assured that the king will come and sort out the mess, even what we see today. The fulfillment of all prophecy in Jesus has happened because Jesus has come into the world. He has died and he has resurrected. But when we look at the world, we still see immorality, injustice, and idolatry. And the fact that Jesus has fulfilled all the prophecies that these two will be dealt with. So we see that the hope that the death and resurrection of Christ has given us points us to in confidence that the second coming of Christ, which is promised, is also coming to pass. We can look forward to that day when all these things will be brought together, when the when Jesus and God are restored as the ones who rule over creation and no longer world powers. We have the great hope that Jesus is coming. The prophecy of the second coming of Christ when he'll come in glory is coming and we have confidence because we have seen Old Testament prophecy that has predicted the coming of Jesus, his death and resurrection, and we've actually seen them. Therefore, we are confident that the final victory that Jesus promises is at hand. Jesus himself prophesies in the book of Revelation, even though this is the subject of next week's uh, message, but this is the ultimate manifestation of the fulfillment of scriptures when everything now comes to perfect harmony and God points us in that direction when all the hopes and dreams we have in the faith come to fruition, when Jesus fulfills them all. So we are confident. We see that all these things are talked about and they are fulfilled. They are real. They are no longer dreams. They are reality now. And when we look at Old Testament prophecy, it should excite us for what is yet ahead of us. So I want to say, the exciting future that the Lord has planned awaits. However, I want to say that it is only for those that are in Christ. If you are not in Christ... Your judgment has not yet happened. It is waiting for you at some point. The fulfillment of that scripture is not necessarily for you at this stage because you still need to go back to the cross. So I believe that the Lord is here and is inviting whoever would like to call upon the name of the Lord as we read in that other prophetic writing and be saved. You are saved from the wrath of God in this age so that when the kingship of Christ comes, you are already living under it. So I'd like to invite if there's anybody who would like to give their hearts to the Lord, who would like to surrender to the Lord and make him their personal Lord and Savior, to pray this prayer with me in your heart to Jesus in faith, and the Lord will save you. That is his plan. That is what he has spoken about in the prophets, 
and he will do it. It is a fulfilled prophecy, so we can pray that in confidence, knowing that the Lord hears us and the Lord will save. So, and then after that, I'd like to pray for us to see that our eyes be open to what Jesus has already done for us, that we see what he has fulfilled in the prophecies, that he gives us an excitement that when we read the prophetic books, we are not fearful, but we are joyful because all of those prophecies are fulfilled. So we'll first pray for those who want to put their faith in Christ, and then afterwards we will pray for, for all of us so that we may see the exciting future that the Lord has for us. Let's pray. So we're starting with those who want to call upon the name of the Lord. Lord Jesus, you have given us your promise that they that call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And mighty Lord, even now, just want to lead those who would like to give their life to Christ. So if you're giving your life to Christ, follow after me. Lord Jesus, today and right now, I call upon your name. And I believe your word that you say that you walked the earth as a sinless man and that you died on the cross and took all our sin and you gave us an exchange for your righteousness. I want to take this free gift now and make it my own. And from today, I am a child of God. Lord, I repent of my sinful ways and I put my future into your hands. I want to live as a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you prayed that prayer, it would be very wonderful to honor the Lord. I'm going to ask you that you come to the front. There will be folk who will be here. who will be praying for anyone, and then they'll give you something at the back so that you can take with you and explain more about the journey that you have started. I'm going to pray the last prayer for all of us that we may see, that our eyes may be open to what Jesus has done. That is, we read the prophetic books. We are not filled with fear, but rather with joy and with hope in the knowledge of what Jesus has done for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that in your word, in many places, you say, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says to the churches. And mighty Lord, we just want to pray that you open our eyes to see the hope, to see the joy, to see the glory of God that he reveals through his Old Testament prophets. Mighty Lord, I pray for all of us that we may share in this hope that Lord, even as we look at our own lives, we will not be discouraged by what we see, but be encouraged by the hope that you bring by the hope that you promise, by the power of God and the faithfulness to his promises. We thank you, our King, and we want to honor you and say, Lord, may we live our lives as covenant people. May we always be those who are reminded. And by your power, Holy Spirit, in us, may you take us to that place of holiness that we too may be holy as you are holy. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.